Uh, we're going to talk about, um, I think, the number one security topic of the month, the year, who knows, maybe the decade, Conficker. Well, yes, I don't think we've ever really gone into great depth about any previous worms or, for that matter, viruses, because there really hasn't been that much to them. I mean, it's like, OK, so, you know, MS Blast sprays the Internet with packets trying to spread. Well, Conficker is interesting to me. And to the, you know, to our, I'm sure to our audience and the broader Internet, because it is a phenomenally sophisticated worm. It is, you know, it's defying all attempts at eradication. It is managing to survive. The author is dynamically updating it literally in lockstep with all attempts to 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 thwart it um, in that have been made by the industry and the so-called Conferker Cabal, which is a group of of white hat companies, Microsoft and the AV companies that are getting together to 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 deal with it. And but there's so much to it. And so the, the, it just, you know, it would make for a really interesting and meaty episode. So I decided, you know, let's let's really, you know, talk about exactly what Conferker does. And my feeling is by the time we're through with our listeners today, Leo, <laughs> There'll be a greater sense of respect for for how bad and sort of deeply bad these things can be. I mean, there's just so much this thing does. Well, as you say, uh, you couldn't really do it ever before. I mean, uh, the stuff was... There wasn't much to talk about. Was, I mean, I guess you could say, wow, isn't it interesting that uh, they're using email now to spread or they're... You know that they're uh, that they're able to uh, live on the net, but there wasn't great programming involved. This sounds like this is pretty sophisticated. Well, it, it digitally signs its its transmissions to prevent anyone from being able to spoof them. State I mean, of the art. This is on state on. of the art. We're going to talk about it all today. All right, Stephen, let's talk Conficker. Now, I want to. I need two ground rules laid first or well okay one ground rule and, and a little bit of technology um I, i'm sure people understand they know me well enough to know that when i'm when i say i'm impressed by something it doesn't at all mean that i'm endorsing it or thinking it's a good idea um there is a lot of state of the art impressive technology in in conficker it's not it's not bleeding edge by any means. It's, it's not something no one has seen before. It's that somebody who was not your typical script kitty, who was not taking stuff somebody else did and just sort of mindlessly duplicating it, but whoever is the author or authors of this, this series of the, the, this genus of worms, because we've had now four of them, um, and there's maybe a fifth one on the way, um, you know, they really understand this technology. So it's certainly the case that that anybody who really understands networking, I mean, I could write Conficker. There's, you know, any of the the smart guys um, in uh, in networking security companies could write Conficker. I mean, you know, it's it's not like this is rocket science, but this is unique for what it is that is that it is it's it's been done in a in a way that is is really reacting um in lockstep to the industry's attempts to to counteract it and how, gonna... how good would you say the guy or guys who wrote this are i mean you said you you could do it any any competent security professional could do it but can you look at the the coding and say this guy knows what he's doing is he a professional is he a kid do you have any sense of that yeah i would say um i, I guess i don't know we, we, i mean f f first of all somebody can be good at any age so we don't have yeah, any sense right. for their th 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 there isn't any nonsense in it for example ah. some of the some of the early bots had had you know like like used f uh, four letter word right S variables slang, right yeah, yeah yeah which sort of made you think okay there's we were a little maturity compromised here <laughs> right. in, in this case right. there isn't any of that um it's can you see variable names you can't can you um 
You're just, no, well, no, but there we don't have the source were, code, but you can disassemble they it. Variable, they weren't variable names; they were like embedded strings right, in right. the executable. Right. Where it was just like, oh, okay, you know, this is you know not somebody we need to take too seriously. Right. Although you know their tools were often times potent, but because they had patched these, you know, patched code that they got from somewhere else, this is clearly being written by somebody who knows what they're doing. And as I said, by the time we're through discussing this in detail, I think that our our listeners are going to have a strong sense for it's like, okay, uh, you know, it in, in many ways, this raises the bar. The Conficker has wow. gotten a huge amount of press. It is, um, it's been dissected by really smart guys. And so, so th- there's, there's now like, OK, anybody else who's going to do a worm is likely going to do everything Conficker does. Now, it is worth giving this guy credit for several things. There is there is new technology in this, for example, the way it generates its domain names that we haven't seen before. It's like what some good guy who I mean, someone who is really networking aware who sat down and said, OK, how can I? have malicious code scattered around the internet somehow find a server to update itself and prevent somebody from reverse engineering the code to see what the domain is that I'm going to be contacting. For example, you know, back when I was tracking down the the, the IRC driven botnet that was attacking GRC many years ago, I was able to look at the traffic, see what the IRC server was that the bot was contacting. And then, you know, I wrote my own pseudo IRC client and logged into the same channel on the IRC server and and watched all the bots talking with, with sort of my own version of an IRC client. Well, so I was able to do that because there was a static domain name that all of the bots in that particular network we're contacting. Well, Conferker doesn't do anything like that. Conferker has a whole several aspects of next generationness to it. So while the technology is not is is not surprising, the fact that it has been employed is arguably surprising and unique. So, you know, that's really what's new. Um okay, the other the, the the second thing is I need to explain what a thread is because Conficker is highly multi-threaded and I realized as I was preparing my notes for what I want to discuss that I'm I mean I live in threadland threads are one of my favorite abstractions in programming threads but, are us but if people don't understand what a thread is, for me to say, oh, and it spawns three threads to do this, they're going to be like, what? what? What's a spawning of a thread? So a thread is, a, is an abstraction of computer execution. It, you know, everyone's sort of familiar probably with the notion that a, that a computer does one thing at a time. It executes one little instruction, you know, add two things together. And then maybe another one, oh, if the result is greater than something, then jump to here and then do something else. So the point is, as we know, computer programs are one thing at a time. And it's because the computers are very fast that all those little things add up to something substantial, like recalculating your spreadsheet or, you know, 3D rendering at Disney. I mean, you know, phenomenally amazing stuff comes out of just lots of little additions and multiplications and 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 decisions being made one at a time well as computer science has evolved it's been nice to have a program a single program being able to sort of do more than one thing at a time windows had one approach which is a, a so-called messaging paradigm where You'd have a so-called message loop, and it would go and and do something, then come back to the message loop and get the next thing to do and go do that and then come back. And so it kind of kept checking back in. Well, that was one way of creating sort of a feeling of asynchronous events. A different way is through something called a thread. 
So if you imagine this series of steps I was talking about, you know, doing one thing at a time, add, compare, jump, you know, store, load, one thing at a time. If you imagine that's a a a chain of instructions or so-called a thread of execution, then it's possible to to have one thread spawn that is start another thread. So it sort of sort of forks into two uh, chains of execution. Now we know that the computer itself can only be really doing one thing at a time. Now that's evolved a little bit as we have like a multi-core processor where we actually have multiple cores. But but if we just take the case of a single processor, this model actually works well no matter how many cores you have. What happens is a thread is going along happily doing its thing and then it's preempted. That is the the operating system says, "Okay, you've had enough time." We're going to switch over to another thread, the other thread, for example, if there were two, and let it run for a while. Well, this switching happens so quickly and so often that the effect is that two things are being done at once. And in fact, there's no practical limit to how many you can have. At some point, if you have you know thousands of threads or maybe tens of thousands of threads, well, Switching among them all becomes a problem because it takes so long to get back to any one thread, and then you begin to have some overhead associated with switching threads. So you don't want to have a bazillion, but but something like Conficker is doing many things at once. It's it's checking to make sure that you're not running antivirus programs. It's and that's one thread's doing that. So one thread, sort of a, a separate little a little spawned off worker is its full-time job for that one thread is, is making sure that um, anything that you start up that might be used to shut it down doesn't have a chance to get going. Then another thread is, is camped out on some listening TCP and UDP sockets, actually one thread per socket. So that if anything any uh, comes in, and attempts to establish a, a connection, that thread will wake up and say, oh, hi, um, glad to see you. Come on in, you know, send me your data, and we'll see what's going to go on. So I wanted to explain that's what a thread is. Um, it's, it's a beautiful abstraction. I call it an, an abstraction because um, in the case of a single processor core, the processor core is only doing one thing at a time. And so you know, in Windows, we've got multiple applications, and the multiple applications probably have multiple threads. So, you know, this one processor is jumping all over the place, not only between individual applications, but between parts of the application where each part is a thread. And again, it's because the system is so fast that it all sort of seems like everything's moving forward and, and alive and running simultaneously when in fact it's literally it's time sharing. So this this thread jumping is is a sort of a form of, of time sharing within a single application. What's cool about multiple cores is if the system has the job like a like a, a, um, a, a contemporary operating system has a bunch of applications and they all have a bunch of threads. Well then the unit of execution is the thread. And if you've got four cores, like a quad core processor, well, you can literally be doing four things at once. So it scales very nicely. You add cores, and instead of having to, you know, instead of having one processor that's madly flying around trying to keep all of the threads moving forward by giving them all a little slice of time, now you actually have two or four cores that are able to simultaneously be running from this myriad of threads in the system, pushing them all forward in time. So it's a nice way of actually leveraging, you know, additional processing power. Okay, so with that bit of foundation, um, we know that Microsoft identified and patched on, you know, on October 23rd of 2008, a flaw in Windows which was one of the many dreaded remote execution flaws, meaning that 
that there was if you had an open port that and your computer was just sitting there with this port exposed a packet could come into the port and this is a TCP connection over port 445 which would create a um a connection to the so-called RPC service the remote procedure call and it was then able to take advantage of a of a small defect in windows that would cause the payload that it provided with the packet to be executed and um in the case of conficker what what conficker did with this with this packet was it actually caused the computer that had received this packet to open a reverse connection in the other direction back to the the ip provided in the packet and and establish a connection to a service that conficker was also running in that attacking machine that would cause the 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 victim to download all of conficker so just, so the first thing was not conficker that that of that first arriving infection was not conficker it was just a it was it was a a packet that only had enough code in it to cause that the that victim machine to to reach out and essentially download conficker from that source target so okay right off the bat a number of machines are going to be protected first of all since port 445 has been a source of so many horrors through windows history i mean it is the the windows file and printer sharing port and many other things are are overloaded on that port many other services are available so it's you know it's a ripe port for exploitation the the good news is many isps have responded by blocking it at their own borders so no 445 traffic is able to to transit into the ISP's network. Now it's not clear whether you are blocked from uh, from other systems within the ISP's network. That is it's not clear how fine grained that blocking is. It's not clear that, you know, somebody nearby like literally on your block if you're using a cable modem would not be able to reach your 445 port from from their machine but it is the case for example that you, that many ISPs are blocking incoming traffic from for, from further out on the internet into their um internal customer network so that would prevent incoming infections also any properly configured nat router would prevent incoming connections and i say properly configured because how many times leo have you and i told people begged them, advised them, implored them to disable universal, universal plug, plug and play. And play. <laughs> yes. Yep. So this Con would, this opens it up? Conficker does. Oh. Conficker right. is a universal plug and play client oh. which will which will reach out and open um incoming ports through your firewall and router if you have not disabled universal plug and play. So it's, so it's a perfect example of, you know, of of why universal plug and play was a really bad idea so just from to, a security standpoint. Just to underscore this. We say a router is a firewall. It is a firewall. It will protect you, except that if something does get on your system and you allow a universal plug and play, it just opens the ports and says, Come on in, guys. Right. Right. Universal plug and play allows you to do through a network protocol. All the kinds of things you can do through the user interface on the router, like open static ports and set up a DMZ. And in fact, the universal plug and play interface is even more powerful than than what is surfaced on the user, you know, the web based user interface really? of most of the standard consumer routers. Wow. Wow. So, you know, there's, and without there's, warning, without any notice, it just does it. Right. Completely silent. No pop ups. No security, no passwords. I mean, this was just an, an a ridiculously insecure thing uh, for Microsoft, of course, was pushing it because it was part of their, you know, plug and play. It w w was a prior technology that we saw for many years in Windows that allowed.
allowed Windows to recognize when you put something in. It's like, oh, I, you know, look, a new piece of hardware has appeared. Let me go find a driver for it if I can. That was plug and play. And this was, you know, universal plug and play that that was sort of awkwardly named because it is, is a completely different technology, but it was the same goal. Yeah. It was just it was it was to allow discoverability <laughs> yeah. so that Universal example, open my ports so I'm insecure. That's yeah, exactly. Have called it. The, yeah. the idea was it would be a zero configuration sort of thing. So that if you ran some software on your computer that uh no that was intended to automatically configure your firewall or or your router it would be able to send out a broadcast to your network and say, hi there, we got any routers out there? And the router would, would through universal plug and play, say, oh, yeah, hey, I'm over here. Oh, and then the, the malware, if that if it was in this case malicious, would say, oh, good, uh, you know, lower your shields, please. Yeah. Let me in. Let my friends yeah. in. Let them yeah. all in. Wow. Yeah. Well, but, you know, it's interesting. It's almost like the guys who wrote this listen to this show. Um, well, they're definitely, you know, they're, they're up on security tuned in again. Yeah. The this is taking advantage of of every available facility. Now, it's worth explaining also just to make sure just another definition that we understand the difference between a worm and a virus, because this is a worm in as much as that if left alone, it would infect all the machines on the Internet that are that are infectable. That is, it needs no user interaction at all. Once it's launched onto the net, it finds vulnerable hosts, infects them with no user interaction, and they turn around and start trying to infect others. Now, one thing that's different about Conficker than, for example, MS Blast or Code Red is those worms, you, we may remember, really brought down um, or or seriously challenged big chunks of the internet because they're, they were so rapidly reproducing. They were pouring packets out as fast as they could. So it had two consequences. One was they tended to rapidly find other infectable machines and infect them. But also it was like little local denial of service attacks. And so if a network had a whole bunch of code red infected in it, you know, it would pretty much go off the net just because its own infections were so actively trying to find other machines. By co by comparison, Conficker is very patient in my own instance of it here. And I've seen this confirmed in, in other analysis. Um, it sends maybe, oh, three to four packets a second, which compared to what it could be doing is really slow. I mean, it's very patient. It's just sort, that, it just sort of pokes away. Is that so that you out. won't notice it, that it's, uh, that it's using a lot of bandwidth? Yes. I can't see any real other advantage. For it, example, mine's One, one been thing running. people do uh, to see if they're infected is they look at the lights on their router, and if it's flickering when nothing's going on, they go, oh, somebody's using my uh, connection. Right. If it's going crazy, on the other hand, you know, mine, I, I, I'm using a hub so that I'm able to monitor Conficker with another machine. Um, and I mean, if I look at the lights, it's going blink, 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 blink. You know, nothing it's to worry few, about. Normal. It's a few packets a second, but it's not going. Right. Right. You know, I mean, let's like crazy. And that's what we have seen, you know, in, in the case of, of other malware infections. So it really it's. Staying under the radar um, that way, it also hmm. does make it less easy to find the clients. Anything that's out there, you know, a, a malware which is pouring traffic out at at random IPs, they'll its own IP is going to end up being known by anybody who's curious. Because all they have to do is put a is put a a packet monitor on a block of IPs. And they're going to see all of this searching traffic coming in to that block of IPs. That is from from all of the different um, infected machines on the Internet that are searching for other machines to infect. So by being much more slow about this, um, although it means that it's going to be slower to find another machine, it also kind of keeps it under the radar. It's got and all the time in the world. I've got to say, too, that. 
as as we go through the way these these conficker variations have changed over time, you know, there's this this desire to find meaning in these changes. It's like, okay, what's the guy thinking? Why, you know, why is it done this? For example, conficker A would immediately abort if the keyboard layout of the computer it had entered was Ukrainian. So if 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 it would check the keyboard layout and if it was a Ukrainian That's layout kind of keyboard, it would not infect. That makes you think um, it might be a Ukrainian that uh, spread it. Yes, there are several reasons to believe that. Um, there's one company in particular, Baka Software, B-A-K-A, is a well-known uh, uh, sort of you know shady uh, operator who's who's been responsible for all kinds of mischief in the past. There was one connection that was caught by some folks that were analyzing Conficker, and they they set up a big honey net in order to in order to look at 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 traffic patterns and and levels of activity on the internet. There was one packet that they found where it was it was Conficker B that was I'm trying to remember it was it was it was a cross version packet so I, it was it was conficker B that was set up to infect conficker A and that's never the case in any version of conficker that is the versions always it, it, with A and B they would they would they had defenses against anyone malicious taking them over Interesting. so A huh. Would you you use A's protocol to 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 spread version A? B would use B's variant protocol to spread version B. Well, this was one connection that was that was deliberately using A's protocol to spread version B. So it would be upgrading A's to B, and it happened that that came in from this a, a block. That is known to be used by this Baca software group in the U- in in the Ukraine. So there's some reason to suspect that there's some connection there. Interesting. Um, but again, unfortunately, so much of this is just it, it. It's you know you're you're having to to divine intent and 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 what's you know what what's behind the the design decisions that are being made. Um. Okay, so um, we know how it originally started. It originally started by taking advantage of this ex this vulnerability, which was patched on October twenty third. Um, I think it was November tenth. So not long afterwards was the first appearance of Conficker A, the first variation of Conficker, which says that a lot of this code was already ready. That is, we hadn't seen this worm before, but this is too much for someone to write in 17 days between, or 18 days between the 23rd and the, the 10th of November. So, I mean, and a lot of this had to be perfected. Um, when we get a sense for the, the, the technology in here, you'll see that it's just way too much. So somebody had this and was waiting for a vulnerability to surface. Now, of course, the embarrassment is that is that the patch was issued on the second Tuesday. Uh, well, actually, not in in this case, it's October twenty third. So it was it was a, a, a an out of cycle patch, not the second Tuesday of the month that Microsoft patched it because they recognized this was important enough to talk about. It. And we talked about it on Security Now, of course, back then because this is you know you don't want to leave any any wide open a remote wormable exploits available for any longer than you have to. My, so Microsoft did an out of cycle patch to close this and still months later, many months later, there are machines that have not been patched. And as we were talking about this before, um, it seems that a, an analysis of the population shows that the, the density of conficker infections 
which are determinable by looking at the incoming IPs into a honey net. That is a block of IPs that is set up sort of as like an internet telescope in order to see um, what, what's going out on the internet. The incoming IPs generally are highest in concentration in geographic regions of the world where piracy is more prevalent. So it does look like there's a correlation between unpatched machines and pirated copies of Windows. So um, the actual payload of Conficker is it's a DLL, a dynamic link library, which is um, first compressed using a well-known compression tool, UPX, it's the one I use myself. It's a very nice executable packing program that makes um, Windows executables much smaller because the, the format that Microsoft designed is inefficient in terms of, its, it, of, of the XE size. So it's possible to, to use standard compression techniques uh, to make it much smaller. Then it is, it is further obfuscated so that, so that when it's, even if you decompress the XE, it still doesn't look like regular code. It needs to get into RAM, and then it sort of it sort of self decrypts itself. So, in order to do an analysis of it, it's necessary to actually load it into memory and then take a snapshot of memory in order to to see what's going. Um, it it installs itself in the service host XE process. If you know anyone who's used Windows and is security aware has looked at their list of running processes, and they'll see a bunch of SVC host.exe. The idea is that that in in Windows, an executable program, you always sort of have to have an an an, an exe as an anchor, but then the exe can either have with it or can load dynamic link libraries into that e executable process space. So what Conficker does is it injects itself into an existing instance of serviced host exe by causing by, by injecting a thread and causing the thread to to run load library that loads the dll into the process um it does a number of other clever things for example the way a dll a dynamic link library loads is there's an initialization sort of stub at the beginning of the DLL that Windows calls in order to let the DLL set itself up and sort of do an internal housekeeping, that that stub is always returned from. And after that returns, th there's like a, a, a return code, success or fail. So it's possible for the DLL to say, whoops, whatever it is I needed, I didn't find here, so terminate me, do not load me. Um, or the DLL is able to say, hey, everything's fine. I'm ready to stay resident here in this process. So Windows waits for that return in order to list the DLL among those that are that is part of this process. Well, Conficker cleverly never returns from that initialization. It accepts, it accepts the fact that it's running and it spawns a bunch of threads to do all kinds of things never goes back to Windows. So Windows never lists it as a DLL that's part of the process. And it's one of the ways that Conficker stays invisible. It also has a null string name um, when it registers as a process. It does so with an empty string name, and it flags itself as, as make me invisible, which is one of the status bits that, that a process is able to set. So again, it works on on remaining sort of off the radar. But it's it's um it's not a root, root kit though, is it? Well, it, it's I wouldn't call it a root kit, but it does a lot of things in order to hide. Um I, I'm gonna run through a bunch of these specific things it does to hide because it and it's also evolved over time. Um one of the things that it needs to do is it needs to know its public IP. If it's if it is infected a machine behind a NAT router the only IP it has is, you know, like 192.168.1.1 or 1.5 or whatever, you know, the, the non-routable IP. But when it sends its packet out to infect another machine, 
And the way the infection works is that a, a reverse connection is made from the victim back to the attacking machine. The, the, the attacking machine has to know the public IP. So you get a load of this. It uses well-known IP checking sites. It connects to getmyip.org or getmyip.co.uk wow. or checkip.dyndns.org. It has it knows all the, the A variant knows all three of those. So it chooses one or two at random in order to or it actually chooses them until it until it gets the answer that it's looking for and uses that remote site whose job is to tell you your IP, it parses the return page to get the IP that is public for its router. It also downloads a, a geographic IP database from maxmind.com. The, the GeoIP database relates IPs to locations, and it uses that in order to avoid attacking any IPs in the Ukraine. Again, the Ukraine. So when it's Again, gen- the Ukraine. Yes. So when it's generating random IPs, it fil- it's car- it carefully filters out any Ukrainian IPs. Now, now if I were the- writing a virus and I lived in the Ukraine, that would be a very handy thing to make sure I didn't infect myself, my friends, and family with my virus. And to make sure you don't upset the local authorities. Oh, yeah, because that's the jurisdiction I'm in, isn't it? Exactly. Oh, very good point. And we know that there, it's much harder to get cross-country cooperation right. Right. than it is to upset, you know, the the police station around the block. And so, so it's been it's been been again it's, it's been surmised that they're not attacking anybody in the Ukraine because they don't want to they don't want to rouse the local authorities, which again I think is very clever. That's smart. Yeah. Now, one of the new technologies that we have not seen in previous worms. That, that the A variant of, con, of Conficker starts is this notion of using a pseudo-random number, uh, pseudo-random, uh, essentially, it's, well, it's, it's pseudo-random number generator that maps to pseudo-random domain names. Um, Conficker version A, and this is one aspect that has changed a lot because it was one area where it was vulnerable to being blocked. Conficker version A every day would um, generate 250 domain names based upon the UTC date. It would get the UTC date by, by querying a lar- from among a large number of well-known public websites. One of the headers that comes back when you request a page is the current date and time in, in, in universal time. So that that way it knew sort of globally that way all the configur instances all over the world would be synchronized to the to the same UTC date which would mean that that on a given day they would all use the date to seed the pseudo random number generator which was used to generate domain names and the A variant of configur would would try we would generate 250 domain names based on that pseudo random generator and then and then perform DNS lookups to look up the IP of that domain name um, using you know the standard public DNS system and then attempt to make a connection on port 80 to a server a web server because of port 80 a web server running on that port if it uh, succeeded by um, in downloading a binary file, it would then go through a substantial process, which I'll describe in a second, to verify the validity of that file. Now, the B variant um, made some changes. Um, for example, the B variant r- dispensed with the keyboard detection, so it would no longer abort if you had a Ukrainian keyboard layout defined in Windows, but it still did the GOIP uh, data in order to filter out Ukrainian IPs, and that has remained to this day. So Configure really doesn't want to upset 
apparently the Ukrainian authorities. Um, B also began the, 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 the task of terminating many popular antivirus, and it began blocking DNS lookups to prevent you from, from going um, to like Symantec or Microsoft or Windows Update to do things that were related to maybe wondering if your computer might be infected or, or finally getting the update that would, um, uh, that, that would cure this problem. On the other hand, all versions of Conficker have closed the door behind them. Conficker got in by using this um, MS, uh, what is it, 08 can't remember the number. I thought like dash sixty eight or something. The 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 you know my, Microsoft's ID for this exploit. Um, what they did was they would modify by patching in memory. They would modify the the vulnerability so that only they could subsequently use it to prevent somebody else from coming up with something malicious that would knock Conficker out of the system. So after they got in, they didn't completely close the door, but they filtered any other incoming traffic to make sure that it was them. So, I mean, you know, a lot of thought was given to this. Um, B also began to incorporate extensive anti-debugging and anti-reverse engineering defenses. This is technology that's been known and done for years uh, a lot of it in the hacking community to, to prevent malware from being reverse engineered. So these concepts were not new, but, you know, it's an, another layer of defense that Conficker was, was employing. For example, it's possible for software to tell if it is being single stepped through, which is one of the typical things you do when you reverse engineering code is, is you, you know, you, 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 you go step at a time in order to see what the code is going to do sort of ru ru running it under supervision. But that always messes up, of course, the timing. And there's there are, uh, so not only timing, but there are other means that can be used to see if breakpoints are being set in the code. So there's, there's much that can be done for code to protect itself against analysis. And Conficker does a lot of that. Um, it uses a... Um, an additional set of public um, services to, de to determine its IP. It uses getmyip.org, also whatsmyipaddress.com, what's, what is myip.org, and, and additionally, as did version A, checkip.dyndns.org. So there's, you know, there, there's been some evolution and variation in Conficker's behavior over time. Um, uh, it, oh, oh, and whereas the A variant went to maxmind.com to load the GOIP filter, version A incorporates it internally. Yeah, it it uses RAR. You mean, you mean version version C? I'm sorry, no, no, B. So B. version B uses uses it, it incorporates the GOIP list internally. It it uses RAR to compress it. And then RC4 to encrypt it, and so it's it's part of the payload. It's built into the body of Conficker version B. Does it seem sensible? It sounds to me like this is the case that it's the same guy doing all three versions. Oh yeah, yeah. There's no doubt that this is the same this the same guy, and it's it's clear that it's you know it's it's wow. Look how A is succeeding. I I can make it even better. So it's probably some um um some. Uh, notion of wow, you know, it's been it's succeeded beyond my wildest imagination. Now I'm motivated to put more time and energy into it. Oh, the way, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the way the way Conficker protects itself is really interesting. Also, it, um, it, it. I mentioned before that it digitally signs uh, itself. So when anything is going to be accepted by an, an existing version, like an upgrade to Conficker, taking it from, from A to B or B to C uh, or beyond C, potentially, and that appears to be happening now. The, the block of executable code is hashed. 
using a a, dig, a digital signature algorithm. A used SHA one. B Configure B used MD six. What's interesting is it is that Ron Rivest of RSA, who designed MD six, publicly disclosed and announced and released MD six just two weeks before Configure B incorporated it. Wow. So, wow. So, That's amazing. I mean, this, this sounds like this guy's like a genius. Well, he's, he's in the game. I yeah. mean, he's actively watching what's going on in the industry and, and, you know, on some level participating a little side note, the very first release of MD six had a bug. A, there was a buffer overrun glitch in MD six, which was found and corrected. Um, this guy was so quick to get MD6 into Conficker B that he incorporated that bug, although it, it, the, the nature of the way it's used would not allow anyone to take advantage of that in order to, to like, you know, take over Conficker. So it didn't represent a, a weakness in his case. Um, okay, so the code is hashed to create a, a 512-bit hash. That hash is used as the key the symmetric encryption key for the rc4 stream cipher that we've talked about at length in prior in previous podcasts rc4 you'll remember was the cipher used um in wep encryption which when used wrong is a bad thing in this case um it's used in a sort of a non-critical fashion so uh the 512 bit hash is used as the key to encrypt the binary then it is signed using public key encryption. The hash is raised to the power of a private key um, taken mod N to create a signature. And that signature is appended to the end of the package. That's the package then which is sent to a, a, a potential recipient version of Conficker. So it reverses the process it takes the public key which it contains raises the signature to that value mod n and due to the miracle of public key encryption that produces the hash so it then uses the hash to decrypt using rc4 and remember that rc4 is just a it's just a pseudo random stream so it generates the same pseudo random stream as was used to encrypt it xors the stream with the body of the of the payload and that produces decryption it then uses that it then hashes that and compares it to the original hash only if they match does it know it was signed by somebody who had the who had the the private key, meaning the author, and nobody else is ever going to have that. So only the author is able to produce new payloads, which would be injected into the Conficker system. Um, the A variant uses a one K bit um, RSA modulus. The B variant uses a four K. Again, just because why not? You know, one K was good enough. 4K, well, that's even better. Um, so, you know, you begin to get a sense for the amount of technology. I mean, you know, state-of-the-art crypto technology, which is in this and and is serving the purpose of, of keeping this thing alive, preventing it from being commandeered, and, and maintaining the, this mysterious owner of this thing in control of this network. Now, the so the we, we talked about how domains are being generated. Two hundred and fifty domains per day were generated by the A variant, but they all they only had the top level domains of dot com, dot net, dot org, dot info, and dot biz. So you know pretty much the the five most popular domains. The problem is that two fifty a day in those top level domains that was it was easy for the the so called configur cabal the you know the anti configur folks the, the 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 white hats who were trying to protect us from this it was easy for them to generate the 
250 domains for tomorrow and the day after and the day after and go pre-register them so that they were able to block Conficker from being able to um, to expand. Well, the first thing that happened, well, I'm sorry, to block Conficker from being able to basically phone home in order to get an update to itself. Because the idea would be that the, the malware author would go and register a domain sometime in the, in like a domain that would be used by Conficker next week. They'd register the domain and set up a web server at, you know, point that, point that DNS address to some IP that they controlled, set up a web server there with a signed package, signed using the technology we just talked about. And so then what would happen is on that day, all the Conficker worms that knew what day it was would generate 250 domain names and try them all. One of them would be a hit and it, only t- it would only take one. They would find that one, look up the IP, connect to that TCP server and download a binary payload, use their public key to verify the signature and um, and to generate the hash used for decrypting it, verify that and run the code. So, I mean, you know, lots of technology here. B added three more top-level domains to that approach, .ws, .cn, and .cc. Um, uh, the other thing that B did was it expanded the domains that it uses for determining the date. It used w3.org, ask.com, msn.com, yahoo.com, google.com, um, and uh, Beidou, B-A-I-D-U.com. Um, yeah, that's like a Google for uh, China. Baidu. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, then the big change that we talked about uh several weeks ago was was the one that also made a lot of press unfortunately i mean a lot of you know sort of y2k scare stuff was what would happen with Configur on april fool's day on april 1st because the c variant was designed to have its behavior change um is, we did talk is, about is this the before. c variant the one that you've, you've been using or you've been yes. playing with yeah okay. yeah c variant is the one i've got and Has it did it I mean it, it it ran but did it ever get any data on April Fools? Or? No, it's well no, w- w- what happened was its behavior changed. It suddenly began querying, it began generating 50,000 domains up from 250, so to 50,000 from which 500 would be randomly selected. And not only that, but whereas whereas A the A variant used those f- the five most popular top level domains and the B variant added those three more WSCN and CC, huh. the C variant uses one hundred and ten different TLDs. I mean, just about everything you can think of, and that creates a huge problem. Because, you know, these are TLDs literally spread globally and under the control of a phenomenal number of registrars. Beforehand, all you had to deal with was the registrars who, who were registrars for .com, .net, .org, .info, and .biz, and then later WSCN and CC. Now, you've got, if, if you're going to preemptively register you've got a big problem. Not only do you have to preempt, preemptively register 50,000 domain names per day, but you've got to do them with all the registrars controlling these 110 possible top-level domains. So with, with the C variant, you know, this whole notion of this cat and mouse basically uh, really got escalated. Oh, it was, it was MS-08-67 was the original variant, uh, the original vulnerability, uh, wh- which was being used for exploitation. So, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Okay. So, okay. So a propagated. So, so we, so, so we have the way Configur phones home by generating domains and trying to contact a, a server at a pseudo randomly generated domain name, which has been, you know, is no knowable in advance but has been made much more complex when we after April 1st when we switched to variant C. 
the the only way that the A variant caused infections was the same way it got infected. That is, it would send out the the um, the the packet, the, the so-called server message block, an SMB protocol packet to port four four five using the TCP protocol. It would connect to the um, the server surface and and take advantage of the vulnerability in the you know, it was the um, um, the original vulnerability that was supposed to be fixed. So a machine that got infected that way would attempt to reinfect other machines. Um, and what it would do is it would just generate IPs at random and an attempt to make a port 445 connection to them, although it would avoid the Ukraine, you know, any IPs that were physically geographically located in, in the Ukraine. Um, the B variant added two additional propagation techniques which oddly were removed from C. So it hasn't always been escalating. It's, you know, it's, it's like its behavior has been changing for one reason or another. And in fact, C is less effective because these other two op, um, approaches were removed. B would use NetBIOS shares to propagate. Um, it, would, it would look for other machines on the local area network, and then it contained a list of 240 common passwords. And so it would attempt to connect to any other machines, any other shares on other machines, and get into them that way. And, oh, and this had an interesting side effect, too, because in, w w within corporate IT, where policies could be enforced, um, if Conficker got in and began scanning the network finding machines and attempting to log into them and guessing wrong, that would trigger the account lockout policies. And so the, in, the actual users were unable to log into their machine because their machine would say, sorry, uh, you've had too many failed oh. pass, you know, uh, <laughs> log, log, login attempts. Uh, you, you're locked out until you talk to your IT administrator. Wow. Um, but B did something else. If you... In, if it saw a removable drive arrive or in the system when it got there, it would copy itself to the removable drive and edit the autorun.inf file to cause that to cause itself to be run whenever that drive was plugged in somewhere else. So it would use USB propagation in order to in order to to move from from one system to another. Um, so um, C removed those two other strategies, but also changed, an, it added another, another approach using the, uh, the, the SMB, essentially, using a so-called named pipe, which is one of the APIs in Windows that allows you to essentially connect a, to establish a, a connection between two machines anywhere on the internet and and send data back and forth through the so-called pipe, which is really just a, a connection but between those. So in terms of hiding itself, Conficker has always taken, you know, gone to some extremes to hide itself. Um, it would give itself a random name in the Windows System 32 directory and set its time and date stamp to the same time and date as kernel 32, which was clever because with, with, with service pack updates and security updates, there's normally a bunch of things that are going to be have to have the same time and date stamp. But rather than, you know, ra rather than, for example, not doing that, one of the first things people who are like used to looking for malware in machines do is they'll they'll sort the directory listing by date and time and look for the most recent changes in the directory, thinking that, you know, something may have, if, if it got into the system recently, it'll have a, a, a current uh, date and time stamp. Well, Conficker says, ah, not so fast. We're going to set our own file date to the same thing as that we know a lot of other files will be set for, which is the, the date and time of kernel32.dll. It also um, uh, sets up multiple threads. One th thread provides 
a constant security service disable so that if any security services are are running like windows update it'll shut that down or um you know any of the other um third party services it it looks at at a whole bunch there's like auto runs avenger uh config and and down add are both cleanup utilities filemon um hotfix um, uh, Regmon, TCP View, Wireshark. It knows about all these different processes and terminates them uh, if you try to run them. It also is, is getting very smart about the IPs that are returned from DNS lookups. If if any DNS lookup returns more than one IP, it says, ah, I don't think so, and it just ignores it. Or if it's a stub IP, like one twenty seven dot zero dot zero dot one, which is which is a local host IP. That's that's something that, for example, I imagine the anti malware guys were doing was they would they would register instead of having to instead instead of setting Conficker off to some other server, they may have been setting them up as just setting the IP to one twenty seven zero zero one, causing it to try to connect to itself, which would fail. But it was just a sort of a nice way of of stubbing that lookup. Well, Configure over time became smart. It also uh, maintains a um, blacklisted addresses. And if it ever got an IP from one DNS lookup that it got from another DNS lookup, it would note the collision and not bother to connect to that same IP. So the other behavior that the, the good guys might have had is to aim when they were like pre-registering all these IPs, they would aim them like, you know, at some monitoring location saying, okay, well, we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to pre-register all these to, you know, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, um, internet address. Well, later on, con, con, Conficker began remembering all the IPs that it had received. And if it ever got the same one a second time, it said, well, I already, I already contacted that and I don't want to be, you know, tricked because it knew that no that, that its own um, secret phone home IP would only be listed at one DNS or that it would have contacted it and there's no reason to contact it again. So it was getting smarter over time. It also had a um, a, lo- a long list of of slash eight networks. That is the first byte of an IP address. It, it knew that, you know, like one um and or like zero one two five ten fourteen twenty three twenty seven thirty one thirty six on 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 are invalid IPs and we know that for example five is an invalid anything starting with five because that was what the Hamachi um, peer to peer system used because it it was a IP space that had never been allocated so Con- so Conficker was evolving over time making a better use of of the resources that it had. Um, and it's just, um, you know, a very robust, strong, um, you know, piece of malware. Um, I, I wanted to read the final paragraph in a report from SRI International that, that did an analysis of this. They, they, they said, Conficker C is, in fact, a robust and secure distribution utility for, the di- for distributing malicious content and binaries to millions of computers across the Internet. This utility incorporates a potent arsenal of methods to defend itself from security products, updates, and diagnosis tools. It further demonstrates the rapid development pace at which Conficker's authors are maintaining their current foothold on a large number of Internet-connected hosts. Further, if organized into a coordinated offensive weapon, this multi-million node botnet poses a serious and dire threat to the internet. Mm. Wow. Well, it sounds like it does. Now, I was just looking, and I saw that, at at least according to Symantec, that some uh, Cs had updated themselves to E uh, after the April Fool's thing in the last couple of days. Yes, that that was what finally motivated me to install my own of uh, my own configure are in you, a honeypot. Are you letting it update? Yes. Yes, I'm not I'm not allowing it to attack anybody else, but I am hoping it's going to go I want to see it con, you know, discover somebody and get itself updated. Oh, interesting. It, it was shortly after April 1st, the, the 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 news went around the security community 
that that we that there was there was an encrypted package that was being acquired by C. And so I was like, oh, OK, at that point, I thought this thing's not going away. I got to get in the game, yeah. and, you know, and, and be watching it myself. Very interesting. I got to say it's uh, very sophisticated. Do you think it's a team of people? Must be a team of people. I don't think so. I mean, not one necessarily. Yeah. One person could easily do this. You know, one smart network aware author could easily do this. Could be his life's work. His great well, achievement. Um, you know, who knows what the goal is or the plan. There well, the, is, the E variant put uh, one of those creepy antivirus things on there. Yes, right? I was yeah. going to say there is now some scareware that is being downloaded by the most recent uh, conficker. And so, it, you know, it may be that they're decided, well, we might as well commercialize this now because uh, we've established ourselves. We're in millions of machines worldwide where, you know, we, we basically we've got a technology that can live as long as it's able to. We're able to give it encrypted, digitally signed payloads anytime by by just you know knowing which domain we, we want to register ahead of time, grabbing that, aiming it at our web server, and con uh, some percentage of configurers will find it. The ones that don't will be establishing a peer-to-peer -peer network among themselves, and they'll be able to pass it back and forth that way. So we've got two things. We've got We've got conficers interlinked through a peer-to-peer -peer network. That is, they're sending these packets out, trying to find other copies of themselves that, that interlinks them in this peer-to-peer -peer network. And they're also periodically, you know, daily, um, attempting to use DNS lookups on pseudo-random num num pseudo -random number generated domain names to basically phone home in order to get um, payload updates that way. So it's a, you know, a very sophisticated network designed to survive what anybody tries to do to it, to, to shut it down. And since, since it's using public key encryption for its digital signatures, we don't know the, the private key. We cannot know the private key. Only the author knows. And so that prevents anybody who might want to, even good guys, from, from taking advantage of that and, and leveraging that in order to somehow deal with this problem. Mm. It's really uh, uh, an interesting um, study, isn't it? I mean, this it is, is I, I, it's a perfect case study in, in what, how the technology can be used in, in order, you know, by a sophisticated author creating a sophisticated state of the art piece of malicious software. Yeah. I mean, there, there really isn't anything that this guy hasn't or, or team hasn't come up with. And the other thing is, thanks to the fact that they've got this, this dynamic update facility, they're able to respond to what the industry does. And that's what we've seen them do. Anything that the Configur cabal have come up with in order to thwart Configur, the author said, okay, fine, I'll just bump the domain names up from 250 a day to 500 a day, chosen from a set of 50,000. Let's see you pre-register all of those in 110 different top levels. Hmm. I guess the other thing we learned from this is how to protect ourselves. I mean, you, it, uh, you, it's demonstrating all the, all the holes, all the things that you might be want to be paying attention to. Well, like yeah. Like auto I run mean, and uh, universal plug and play. I mean, there's a lot of it's, what I liked about it is that everything we've talked about in yeah. the approaching four years of this podcast um, are things that if our listeners were diligent about doing, uh, would be one less way that they could be bitten by this. Right, right. Because if they've got universal plug and play disabled, if, you know they're, they're going to be in better shape. And if they've got uh, auto run disabled on, on, uh, on removable drives, they're going to be in better shape. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's an example of why security matters and how you can be protected by security. Well, thank you. Very interesting uh, expose. You can read more about this on Steve's website, grc.com.